So, Greg, against Maryland, it was good to see the Huskers' special teams early on going against a team that had nothing to lose. I mean, Maryland was desperate. They're going to do anything they can. And so for uh, the, the Cornhuskers to snake out, uh, sneak out uh, that uh, fake field goal right off the bat was, was a good sign. Sure was. It was just a good sign to see this team jump on somebody early. I mean, it's just you think back through this season, and it's been an uphill climb every game, uh, you know, four or five straight weeks of being behind at halftime. And, yeah, you kind of knew some stuff like that was going to happen for Maryland where they are, where they are at the season, big underdog on the road, that they would try to do a few things. That, and if you if you study their scouting report, their, their field goal kicker is accurate, but not he doesn't have much accuracy beyond 40. That kick was well beyond 40, and so you kind of had a feeling something was up. So then, as you call him, the Grand Island gunslinger heads out on the field, <laughs> and you were wondering whether Riker was going to get the full playbook or not. And boy, he got the full playbook and then some, and he made some big throws on that first drive. Played really well. And credit Danny Langdorf. He gave him a game plan that he could execute really well. And it's been funny. I, I've I've been saying for months that Nebraska could win games with Riker Fife, and I, I don't think anybody believed me. I, I, I don't know. I guess the Purdue game last year just was such a stain. But I knew Riker's got some ability. And he clearly was our number two quarterback coming out of spring. He clearly was the number two quarterback coming to the August camp and just has been waiting his turn. And, and that was a really good – step for him and what a great day for him senior day the chance to kind of wipe out the memory of that Purdue game from a year ago his other start at Nebraska and just really proud of the way he handled himself and that those first couple drives uh, they were surgeon like I mean he, mm-hmm. he was precise and uh, accurate and uh, it, w- it was fun to watch I thought one of the big plays was later on up seven nothing that quarterback draw on fourth down that really just seemed like a dagger to that Maryland defense Another misconception about Riker Fife is that he can't run. He's a pretty good athlete. And he's, is he Tommy? No, uh, he you know he's not you know he's not a blistering runner, but he's he's good enough that he can take it and go. And I love the play call. That was just great. Maryland didn't sense that coming at all, and and uh, that was fun for him. And and also to see the reaction of Tommy Armstrong on the sideline mm-hmm. after that run was pretty fun to see. So then we get Spencer Lindsay in kicking field goals. And as you pointed out in the broadcast, I don't think it mattered who was kicking that field goal. That thing was getting blocked and almost taken back to the house. Yeah, that's fortunate. Nebraska, untouched was that rusher off the edge. Really inexcusable. And that's been that's been a seriously a stain for Nebraska most of the year are things on special teams that are hard to explain. Um, you know, 12 men on the field penalties in, in, a, you know, in the Minnesota game was – was a critical error. The block field goal last week uh, could have resulted in points, didn't. Nebraska was fortunate that it didn't. But again, like Riker, five, what a special day for Spencer Lindsay. Mm-hmm. Drew Brown gets knocked out on the opening kickoff. Spencer Lindsay comes in perfect on the, the extra points, uh, did a good job on the kickoffs, and, and then just too bad that he didn't at least get it up in the air and had a block well enough to get it up in the air and at least attempt to make a, his only field goal in his Husker career. We talk about the special teams sniffing out the fake field goal. They didn't do so well on the fake punt later on, but then the defense bailed them out with the three and out and forced an actual punt later on in that drive. Yeah, you know, defense was just great all yeah. day long, minus the one play. And and that's really been, you know, outside the Ohio State game, the story of this season is the much improved play on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Maryland isn't a huge threat. In fact, well, they surprised a lot of us by the quarterback that they ran out there. Mm-hmm. We, Brass was kind of preparing for three guys. He was a fourth, and that's the one that goes the whole way for them. Basically. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that guy last week, Greg. You and I didn't talk no. about it at all. No, and uh, fortunately, you know, a couple minutes before kickoff, I saw my counterpart at Maryland, and he goes, hey, by the way, Max is starting at quarterback. And I gave him a look, and he looked back at me like, <laughs> yeah, we're not really sure what's going on either. Uh, so, yeah, the, the defense has really had the clamps on Maryland most of the day, and this defense has been really solid all year against the run. And again, they just really pinched that off against Maryland. And then Riker later on showing his legs again on a big third down conversion and a drive that was assisted by a couple of pass interference calls. And like you said, that finally that comfortable first half where you put a little bit of breathing room, you beat a team that should be beaten, and you put it out of reach. And so the second half is somewhat academic at that point. Right. You know, and that's, you know, that's been one of the things that's missing most of the season is that kind of a half. Even go back two weeks one and two against Fresno and Wyoming, a chance to just really punch those teams out early, and it didn't happen. And so Nebraska had to keep kind of playing hard into the fourth quarter. Now, the 21-0 lead at halftime, I think, then worked in reverse because Nebraska 
wasn't very sharp at all in the second half, and I think relaxed and felt like, all right, we got this one in the bag. Let's you know shut her down, gear her down a little bit, and get start thinking about Iowa a little bit. And that was a little disappointing that they didn't add on to that total in the second half. Short weeks are never good when it comes to injuries, and let's start with Riker Fife and his broken wrist. It's on his non-throwing hand. Is there any possibility he suits up for this game? Oh, I think so. Um, you know, he he hurt that late in the game last week, uh, came into the media session after the game and had ice all around that hand, and then we learned on Monday that he actually had surgery on Sunday and they had a pin inserted into the wrist. He practiced on Tuesday, and I, I think he could – I think he could play in, in this game. It's his non-throwing hand, and, and Nebraska might have to operate primarily out of the shotgun with him. But they they are ba- about an eighty percent shotgun team anyway. Uh, so yeah, I think I think he could play. Everything else is fine. His legs are fine. His throwing hand's fine. Uh, so I, I I think he could go on Friday. You're right. The short week doesn't help. You'd love it in one extra day, but I think he could go if necessary on Friday. How about Tommy? What's Tommy's status? <laughs> What time is it? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's getting better. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, middle of last week, he could barely walk. I mean, he was had a no- noticeable limp to his gait. Then on Saturday, I saw him at the game, and he was in sweats, and he was walking better. Uh, they, they've come up with some kind of contraption that's like a elastic band that kind of acts as a hamstring that attaches to his, his, his uh, bottom area and then goes down to the calf and it kind of adds a little support there. It's the darndest thing, but I, in his mind, he's going to play. And if I have to guess right now, he will start the game. Now, how long can he go? Um, I that That's a question, and I, I don't think there's any doubt that the playbook will be limited because if he's out there, he's not very mobile, and, and that's the key to Tommy is the ability to escape a pass rush and, and buy time for receivers to get open and extend plays. I don't think he can do much of that. So it's going to be really interesting to see how Nebraska plays this on Friday. But my guess is he will start the game and and at least give it a try. And obviously nothing against Zach Darlington, but you do not want to have to go to Zach Darlington to uh, win a game on the road in this situation. No, but you have to have him ready. I mean, you know, if Tommy goes and only can play a series and then gets, you know, chased and re-injures the hamstring or tweaks it again and just can't hardly walk and, Riker's hand hurts too bad and he just can't catch snaps or whatever the case may be. You got to have somebody out there to, to run that position. So it's been a crash course the last couple of weeks to get Zach up to speed, at least to be able to run parts of Nebraska's offense. And it, it's, it, this has been a stressful week for the coaches, no doubt about it. It wouldn't have been if Riker hadn't hurt the hand. I think mm-hmm. they would, I think it would have made it probably a lot more easy on the decisions for this week, but, but that happened and now you've got to deal with it. How about Drew Brown? Any lasting effects from his injury? Uh, going through the pr- the protocol, okay. but I think they're optimistic that he'll be able to play. It wasn't it wasn't a bad hit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it it dazed him a little bit. Kickers aren't used to a ton of contact, obviously, and so I think that it kind of threw him a little bit for a loop. But I think they're optimistic that Drew will be able to kick him. I think Jeff. I think that's big. Yeah. I, when you look at this game and and you think it's probably going to be low scoring, it's going to be tight. Uh, a kick at the end of the game might mean the difference. And what Nebraska loves it if Drew's out there being the one that they, they can trust to, to win a game for them. And what an interesting series this has been with the Hawkeyes. The last four games have all been won by the road team. What is that? Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, four straight. Four straight road winners in this series. The only one that went the other way was Nebraska winning the very first one in Lincoln uh, when Nebraska's first year in the Big Ten Conference. It's been crazy. Now, two years ago, Nebraska was kind of fortunate. Iowa had really built a nice lead. Husker said that furious fourth-quarter comeback. Uh, thanks in large part to DeMornay Pearson L, who got loose for a couple of big punt returns, and then the Huskers won it in overtime. But um, I, I think I think this will be a slugfest game. I think it'll be a lot like Nebraska's game with Wisconsin, a lot like Wisconsin's game with Iowa. Uh, I, I think it'll be that type of game on Friday. And a tough high, Hawkeye team to figure out. I mean, this is a seven and four team, but yet only three and three at home. Four of their five wins, uh, four four out of the five games that they've played on the road, they've won. They lost at home to North Dakota State, and we in this part of the country know there's nothing to be embarrassed about when you lose to the Bison, but still, it's an FCS team. But then they come back and beat Michigan at home. Yeah, after getting slaughtered the week before by Penn State. Yeah. And that, that, that's what's hard to figure out what's going on with them. My sense is they've kind of found their identity. they found their stride here late in the year, and it took a bottoming-out effect uh, like the Penn State game, much like Nebraska's 
Purdue game a year ago. I think sometimes the teams need to hit kind of rock bottom and go, wait a minute. It kind of wakes you up. It's a shock to the system. I think the Penn State game was for Iowa. And what makes me nervous is that the, 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 the win over Michigan has vaulted them to a new level of confidence. And uh, it's a team that's reared up and ready. Uh, they, a lot of these guys know that they've lost to Nebraska the last couple times at home. And, you know, they have a chance to finish strong and, and kind of bail out a year that a month ago was like kind of a disaster for them. But if they can win on Friday over Nebraska, along with the, the Michigan win two weeks prior, all of a sudden, not a bad year at all in Iowa City. And we've talked about the Huskers getting a lot of confidence on defense with the rushing performances, uh, holding the rushing offenses down against Minnesota and Maryland. Iowa's defense has gotten a lot of confidence as well with the Michigan game, and then they're performing against against Illinois. Absolutely. You shut out Illinois on the road. One of their interesting quirks about Iowa's game with Illinois is that the Illini did not kick off in the game. And you can sit there and go, how how did that happen? Well, Iowa took the wind. Both halves because mm-hmm. it was a windy day, and they go, our defense is playing great. We'll play field position. We'll kick off both halves. And so then I would, Illinois didn't score, so they never had a kickoff in the game. Uh, I kidded Kirk Ferentz about that. I said, well, your kickoff return team didn't do much in that Illinois game. <laughs> didn't have a chance. Yeah, they're, they're playing confident. they got a great linebacker, uh, Josie Jewell, who's a Butkus finalist. Obviously, uh, in, the, in the secondary, Desmond King won the Thorpe Award a year ago, so they have a couple of stars on that defensive side of the ball. Yeah, Jaleel Johnson's good, too. He's in the top five in the conference in yep. sacks as well, plus seven on turnovers the Hawkeyes are this year. They've only fumbled the ball twice, or at least only lost two fumbles on offense. Both teams pretty good in that category, and that's been a huge part of Nebraska's success. Huskers are plus five in that category where they've been in the minus category the last four or five years. And Mike Roddy said on Monday a big reason why Nebraska's record has flipped around this year is that, that turnover thing. So turnovers will be at a premium. Uh, low-scoring game, one mistake or one big play might mean the difference in this game. And you got to wonder whether this is going to be a running back game because, of course, you've got Terrell Newby and, and uh, Zigbo and the guys uh, on the Big Red. And then you've got Wadley and Daniels, who uh, both average more than five yards a carry for Iowa. And so could be whichever team establishes the running game does well in this one. That's exactly what it is. And Iowa had, a, had trouble with that early in the year. They weren't running the ball very well. They weren't stopping the run very well. That's a bad combination. They flipped the script on that the last couple of weeks. Nebraska's kind of been the opposite. They've done a great job defending the run all year long, but the running game's been inconsistent. So can Nebraska get a consistent running attack? And with the gimpiness of the quarterbacks, I think that's ultra important in this game. And we talked about some of the special team issues in the Maryland game. Riley McCarron, here's the guy that's at the top or the top two of both the kickoff and the punt return numbers in the Big Ten, a guy you got to watch out for. He's done a good job, so is Desmond King. They use him back in those return games as well, and he's a, he's a dangerous threat. And as I mentioned earlier, special teams has been kind of hit and miss for Nebraska. I, I would guess that Iowa believes they've got the advantage in the return games. I think Nebraska, I don't, Nebraska wouldn't trade their kickers, but in the return game, Iowa feels like they've got an advantage in that game. It sets up a fun one on Friday. So let's talk about what Nebraska can control, getting to 10 wins for the first time since 2012. Yeah, Mike Riley was asked earlier, well, what's this game mean? And, you know, he said a lot. I mean, one, it's Iowa. It's a team that's a border rival. It's a team that we butt heads with on the recruiting trail. A chance to get to 10 wins, which are very special seasons. A chance to keep the Big Ten West hopes alive. Because, you know, if you win the game, then you got a chance. Mm-hmm. You, gotta, you need Minnesota to win on Saturday. But, hey, this is college football. We see upsets every week. So there's a lot at stake. A better bowl game. Uh, it, this is a really big football game for Nebraska. And I, I, going from five wins last year to maybe ten in the regular season to ten this year, wow, what a great turnaround for Mike Riley. And the good news, I don't know, maybe you don't look at it the same way I do, Greg, but the good news is I think because that go for Badger game is on Saturday, it's not going to be a distraction for Nebraska on Friday. No, no scoreboard watching during the game. It's take care of business. It's get in there, get, get the job done. Find a way to win, however you have to do it, with whatever quarterback is <laughs> capable of standing up and catching the snap. You just have to find a way to win. And these are, these are gut check times. This is what defines season sometimes. It's, can you dig deep enough when a lot of odds are stacked against you and find a way to get a victory? That's, that's a tremendous challenge, but a great opportunity for Nebraska on Friday.